so games are good. A lot of you are aware of this, but there's some of you that may not be quite convinced yet. Now, through my research and through my outreach, I've been trying to promote why games are good and how they can be beneficial to all of us. And I know as a gamer and a game designer, in order to make a really compelling game, you need a strong protagonist. So let me introduce Boxy the Boombox guy. That sounds kind of familiar. And he's gonna be helping me through the rest of this presentation. Now, there's a lot of reasons why games are good, but let's start out with a pretty obvious one. First of all, games are good for business. So, why are they good for business? Well, the most obvious reason is it's a multi-billion dollar industry. It's good for our economy. It makes jobs. Now, we're at TEDx Columbia. You may be thinking that all these jobs, all the gaming jobs are on the West Coast. Well, yes, there's a lot of games uh, jobs on the West Coast, but there's actually a couple around here that may surprise you a little bit. Right down the road in Irmo, there's a company called Speed Tree. There we go, I'm short, I have to hold it up a little higher. But there's a company called Speed Tree. And if you've ever seen a tree or a piece of shrubbery inside of a video game, it is developed in Irmo, South Carolina. And I'm not talking about necessarily small games at all. I'm talking about they have been a part of some of the biggest titles to come out in recent years. And they're not just limited to video games. Their company has also worked with Hollywood as well. There was this, um, there was this little film, I think it was an independent thing, uh, called, what was it called? <laughs> yep, it's called Avatar. They came out a little bit ago. Any of the scenes that showed the canopy shots, any of those flyovers, was actually developed by a program made by Speed Tree. So a lot of those parts were developed in Irmo, South Carolina. So yes, games are good for business, and they do exist around here. Now, whenever you have good business, you have good economy. And then when you have a good economy, usually that leads to a good art scene, which leads me to the next point, that games are good for artistic expression. <laughs> Some of you may be playing this now. <laughs> so, they're good for artistic expression because, well, first of all, games are an amalgam of a lot of different art styles. 2D art, 3D art, sound, narrative, all of this is indicative to modern games. But it goes a little further than that. There's some games out there that actually promote creativity. And I'm gonna talk about a couple of them, one of which I'm a big fan of, is called Little Big Planet. Inside of this game, People can create their own systems. They can create their own games with it and express ideas through this game. Another one that some of my students play a good bit, and I, I play it too, is Minecraft. And Minecraft, <laughs> people have started making these elaborate sculptures out of the systems in the game. They're not even really playing the game. They're using it to design stuff. Now, we've actually worked on a couple of games that can harbor this level of creativity. And it's as simple as drawing on a piece of paper. This game is called Linus, and what you see, our character is running around on a line that I've just drawn on a piece of paper. This uses image processing to add elements to this world. The goal point in this game are circles. It can detect a circle, and it does all of this in real time. So you can design levels and stages with this. The main idea of this game is you use your world to save his world. Now, this seems kind of difficult right now because as you can see, our character, well, it can't really reach that cupcake. So, how should we, uh, how should we solve this problem? Well, um, hmm. it's pretty simple. Why don't we just introduce a new line? Because it does all of this in real time, you can keep drawing and keep building on these different levels and in fact, create different style puzzles. Now, it doesn't just stop at that, so there you go, that solved that one pretty easy. But it's not just limited to drawing lines on a piece of paper. Quite literally, if you're having trouble, you can give Linus a hand to use to solve the problems. Now this adds a certain level of creativity as well, and I love giving this uh, system to my students and have them play around with it. And I've learned that 
sometimes you encounter problems that don't seem obvious. So in this one, how could you solve this puzzle without introducing a new lie? Well, seems kind of hard, but the idea is sometimes much in life, the biggest problems can be solved by just using a different perspective. And then the problem is not so hard to solve at all. So these are games where people are encouraged to be creative, but it doesn't just stop with that. In recent years, there have been several games that have come out that have gone through the human condition. Games that can, you can experience love, loss, and other points of your life. <laughs> and these are a couple of them that I highly recommend to people to play because these are considered the art games. But there's one in particular I want to talk about, and it's something that I've been encouraging through the efforts of people who work for Indie Grits to bring an artistic game scene to Columbia more so. This game is called The Marriage by Rod Humble. Now, he set out to create a very minimalist game. He wanted to have people gain an understanding for how his marriage worked, not through graphics, not through narrative, but through the gameplay itself. As you're playing through this game, you start gaining an understanding of how the relationship between him and his wife worked through playing it. It's very thought provoking. It seems very simple at first, but then when you start thinking about the implications, this becomes a powerful medium. This is another reason why I've been promoting this game as an art scene, and a reason why I've been promoting game design inside of our schools, because obviously, games are good for education. And I've always viewed education as the consumption of knowledge, just like tiny, delicious white pellets. And I've been teaching games and design for a couple of years now. And there's a couple of different methodologies that we've found that we can teach by. One of which is learning through play. So when people play a game, they can take something from it. They can learn from it. And there's a couple of schools across America that have used games as part of their curriculum. Now, we've created a game called Lost in the Middle Kingdom, which teaches people Chinese. Think of it like this. We use total immersion it is Rosetta Stone the game. There is no English in this at all. But in order to solve puzzles, you have to interact with these items. So, okay, we pick up a bucket, and uh, uh, okay, a tree's on fire. Um, so we need to scan this. Okay, that, that's water. We put out the fire with the water, so we can pick it up, throw it at the tree. <sighs> okay, problem solved. Uh, oh, oh, the, the barn's on fire. Okay, so we need some more water. Okay, that bucket's fallen down. Uh, that one still goes, so we could use that, but we don't have enough water. So what can we do? When you scan these objects, you start building what's called a library. And using that, you can recreate other objects to use to solve other puzzles. So all I have to do is create another bucket of water, and eventually, I could solve this problem. Now with the library, each one of the entries has a pictorial representation, a pronunciation guide, a character representation, and also a part where you can listen to a native speaker saying the word. Also with this, you can interact with non-playable characters and they kind of guide you to what you need to do next. And if you notice, under certain characters, you have an image. These are words that you've learned and placed into your library and the other ones are question marks for words that you haven't learned yet. You could play mini games in order to gain those words and continue to build that library up. Now, your library isn't sacred. Enemies can actually corrupt certain words in your library and make it harder for the game. You have to relearn those words. That's the drilling practice, but we kind of hide that through the play itself. And through our studies, we found that we can effectively teach Chinese using this game. But it doesn't just stop with playing games. We've also learned that through game design, we can educate people. I've been teaching from the middle school level to the college level game design for a while. And what you see behind me are games that were created at the Governor's School of Math and Science in two weeks. Some of these are pretty advanced games. And the interesting thing that we figured out from this is teaching game design reinforces math skills. It reinforces science ability. It, re it actually helps with artistic ability. It helps with teamwork. And some of the people that I've taught how to make games, they now attend places, I don't know, like Georgia Tech, some attend Carnegie Mellon, and there's some even working at MIT. 
So games can help these useful aspects in life. Now, when you have education, that derives innovation, which is why I now say that games are good for research. They're a good problem-solving tool. And we've used games and the tools to make them, and even principles of games, to solve some research problems. Some of my first early works was actually in pursuit of Asian problems, where I used game engines. Other ones involved uh, power system simulations for different military branches. Other stuff involves pathfinding algorithms that we used inside of games. And we've, done, we've used this for other projects as well. Now, one of the most recent ones we've worked on is this problem. So, okay, just you know, solving this problem, we were, we were talking to different researchers, and we realized that, well, there's something that no one has really done before, which is visualize the human genome in three dimensions. Think of it this way. What if you could view the human genome with a system that works much like Google Earth? where you can zoom in, zoom out to the, the largest level and view the whole thing, but then zoom all the way into the atomic level. This can be a difficult problem because the human genome has a lot of information. In order to do that in an interactive system in real time can be daunting. However, if you start applying systems that games normally use, this is a common practice. And using this, we've actually created a small system where we can do that, where someone can put their human genome into this and you could go from the high level to the very low atomic level. And this has some heavy implications. Researchers can use this to look for genetic markers. They can use this for prognosis and diagnosis of genetic diseases. There's a lot of potential for this. And this is why we've been promoting this as well. Now, like I said, this has implications for health as well, which is why Games are good for health. <laughs> now, there's some obvious ways that games are good for health. And probably one of the most obvious reasons are whenever you have games that promote exercise. They're called exer games, actually. And I actually stand behind a couple of those. Like some of the, the big ones in this category are like Dance Dance Revolution and also We Fit. And it's been shown through research that people can effectively lose weight and become healthier through those games. At an anecdotal level, I know that since I have played Dance Dance Revolution at a competitive level, I've lost a good bit of weight myself. <laughs> and just look at me now. <laughs> but it's not just good for physical health. Think of this. What if we kind of modify Dance Dance Revolution a little bit? Instead of having arrows, we had pictures that would scroll. And instead of pressing a button at a certain cue, you had to say that word that was on the picture. And using speech recognition software, we were able to evaluate how well you said that word. That may not seem too, too interesting right off, but what I just described is a method to help people with aphasia relearn how to talk. There was an amazing talk last year on this topic. And if you don't know, aphasia is a condition where you've lost the fluency of your first language. In other words, you can't speak. You know what you want to say, but you can't say it. Using this game, we've shown that there is potential for this. We've shown through this game that we can actually teach people how to speak again. This is what makes games really powerful, which is ultimately why I strongly believe that games are good for society. I've shown how games are good for business. I've shown how games are good for artistic expression. I've shown how they're good for education. I've shown how they're good for research and also good for health. And the whole topic of this talk was ultimately games are good for all of us. Now games do not make monsters. If we know how to use them correctly, games can benefit all of us. Thank you for your time.